Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast, episode number 62. I'm Ramon Mia. I'm here to bring you the latest little RPG news, reviews, and of course, author interviews. And this week, I have seven new Lit RPG reviews just for you folks. Uh, working extra hard on getting these reviews taken care of for you. Um, writing suffered a little bit, but not too much. Uh, the first review I'll be doing this week is going to be The Eternal Transcend, which is uh, book three in the world of Gaim. Uh, then after that, it'll be Kingdom Level 3, which is the third book in that series. Also, The Long Road to Karn, uh, The Realm of Archon, Book 5. After that, it'll be Necromancers, Demons, and Kings, uh, World of Samar, Book 2. And then after that, it is going to be Office Wars, Bathroom Politics. And then after that, it's going to be Tossing the Salad, uh, Caverns and Creatures, sorry. And then finally, it'll be The Builder Soar, The Legendary Builder Book 1. So there you go. Uh, but of course, we begin our show with Lit RPG News. And in Lit RPG News, we're going to begin with a wonderful discount deal, which I'm always a big fan of personally. Uh, the author of Caverns and Creatures, Robert Bevan, has put a ton of his books on sale uh, until the first. Uh, I believe until the 30th of July uh, on sale for like 99 cents. Um, and a lot of them are also going to be on Kindle Unlimited, so you can pick them up that way as well. But specifically, um, I think the, probably the best deal that he has is going to be the first four books, the full-on novels of his Creatures and Cavern series um, called Critical Flayers. Um, together as an omnibus is 99 cents. So you get four books for less than the price of one of them normally. So it's a great deal. It's in the US and the UK only, unfortunately. So anybody outside those countries... I'm sorry. Um, maybe you can convince somebody to buy them for you in the U.S. and then they can just send you them. There might be a way around that, and you can just pay them back. The nineteen cents. Um, additionally, um, a lot of his short story collections are also going to be on sale as well. So, great stories, really funny, um, bunch of potty humor, you know, poop jokes and stuff. Um, but I, I think it's super hilarious myself. But group of friends travel to a portal world. They're stuck there, trying to get out hilarity ensues um we'll be reviewing one of the short story one of his newer short stories later in the show okay um in other news you also have uh, office wars author of that james Patton, is putting the first book in his series up for free so beating 99 cents it's up for free up until august the first so from july the 28th to august the first it's going to be free because on the first of august book two in that series is going to come out so it's kind of a promotional thing from the author uh but free can't be free also, just a quick reminder for everybody, um, sometimes there are audiobook versions of these same novels, and if you already have the Kindle version, um, sometimes you get a discount on the audiobook version, so be aware of that, that even if you've read a story, if you want the audiobook version, sometimes not a discount, you can do it that way. It's a sneaky thing, I know, but it's, you know, it's, it's promotional for Amazon. They sell more things that way. Okay, uh, also in Little RPG News, we have, oh, um, this is kind of a sadder story um, from Aiden Avery, author of the Sh Spellbinder novel, book one in the Shadow Legacy series. Um, the author of that series has recently removed um, the sequel to that story um, and all the pre-orders for an entirely new series he was writing and publishing called The Space Masters from Amazon. Now, the author told me in an email, I talked to him previously about it, about the review that he gave his first book. Um, and he told me that basically because of the poor reviews in book one for Spellbinders, that he had decided to remove some information from books two and from the Space Master series. Recently, he changed his mind about how much he wanted to put in the book. Um, and so he's pulled the pre-order, he's pulled the book just so he can make the stories better. Um, he, he basically told me that um, by email that he, he's done all this stuff because he felt that his works did not reflect what the Little PG community deserved. And he hopes by doing this, he can kind of relieve the pressure for himself um, and create better stories. So um, while it's always sad to see novels get pulled down for creative reasons, um, this is not the first time that this has happened, that an author has done this in, in our community. Um, Jaden Hunter did the exact same thing for very similar reasons in wanting to create the best story possible. Um, it did mess with sales, um, but it is a, it's an author's right and a choice um, that I'm always going to at least understand because as, as somebody who's creative as well, I also want to put the best things possible. So I understand that mindset at least, but so I said to see a, a, a series get pulled down for whatever reason, uh, because that means that people can't enjoy it if they choose to. So there you go. Okay. Uh, also in little bit news, uh, 
Alaron Kong has said on Facebook that the latest book in his Chaos Seed series is just taking longer than he thought it was going to be. Uh, apparently, it's the biggest novel he's written in the series so far, and it's just not going to be ready by the end of July like he thought it was. He'd previously thought it'd be mid-July, didn't hit that deadline. End of July, not going to happen either. Um, the author does apologize for the delay, but he wants to make it as good as possible as well, and so he's just not going to put it out until he feels like it's ready. Um, so... You also have to remember, folks, that Alaron Kong is actually Dr. Alaron Kong. He's, um, I think, a doctor of internal medicine. Um, so he's a real live doctor with a full time job with like four or five or six, 10 hour days sometimes. Uh, so he also has a limited amount of time to write. So we have to be a little lenient in that respect, I think. But I'm looking forward to seeing it, the novel, whenever it comes out. Okay, uh, last but not least, uh, Jeffrey Falcon Lowe has released the cover art for his second book in The Hero of Not. Uh, series that he's written. He says he actually hasn't written the novel yet. Um, he might be working a work in progress. Um, the first book came out not too long ago. We reviewed it. Uh, but the cover art for this one looks creepy. I mean, and in a good way, because the author is, uh, the story is not, it, it's a darker story. So it, it's very is reflective of, of the tone of the particular series. So, um, but I see like creepy rabbits, creepy guy in the background, creepy wolf, um, and a creepy lady. So Lots of interesting things here. Uh, so I hope it's good. I look forward to reading it when it comes out. But it is a very uh, mood-inducing cover. And it's suitably evil adjacent. Okay, uh, now, uh, these are some stories that came out this week that I couldn't review. We're reviewing them the next week. Uh, including the Slime, Tamer, Slime Tamer's Chronicle, Volume 1. Uh, the And then, Wild Times in Virtual Reality, A Total Immersion VR Adventures Unlimited, Little RPG, Long Title, uh, also, uh, after that, it'll be Human, a Little Bridge novel, Tower of Gates, Little Bridge series, book two, and additionally, uh, Unexplored, Into the Wildwood, a Little Bridge virtual fantasy adventure. So there you go. So those four novels I'll be reviewing uh, next week as well. Okay, uh, and some new stuff that came out for Little Bridge audiobooks. Lion's Quest, Do Will, so by Michael Scott Earl, friend of the show. Um, hey, uh, book one audiobook must have done well because he's putting out for book two, so yay, uh, I like it. Uh, also, Way the Clan Ruled of Valdira, book one, is also out as an audiobook. Now, the um, the publishers chose a very interesting shift in cover art for this particular article. It kind of reminds me of um, of a romance novel, which is a weird marketing strategy to me. But um, the audiobook is out for people to listen to. Uh, also, uh, The Land, um, book three, uh, Alliances in the KSC series is out as an audiobook. It came out on the Friday that this audio, that the last podcast came out. So I didn't know about it. Um, so I'm letting you know about it now. But it's been out for a week. It's already on the bestseller list for Audible, so it's obviously doing well. Uh, you guys, so anybody who hasn't heard about that it's out, it is out. And uh, of course, one more. Gamer for Life, Alpha World Book 1 by Daniel Shinofon is also out as an audiobook. So there you go. Okay, uh, upcoming Little RPG. This is where I just read off all the stuff that I know that's coming out. I've had some a number of stories drop out recently from this list. Like, they just disappeared from Amazon. Um, uh, some of them I already mentioned to you. Uh, a few others just poof. I don't know why. And I had a few others, like, move their release dates. So I'm just going to read them off to you. You can skip ahead if you want to. But if you want to know what's coming up for um, July and August, here it is. Um, on the 31st of July, it'll be A Slave in the Lock Lands, the weirdest new book, too. On August the 1st, it'll be Office Wars, Bathroom Politics, which I'm reviewing today, though. Um, then on also on August 1st, it'll be Into the Black, uh, book three of Alpha Century series. On the 4th of August, it'll be The Glitch Fiends, part two, Hell's Glitch, book three. Always a confusing title. Uh, then on August the 8th, Side Quest. This one's new. Um, then on August the 11th, it'll be Stratus Online Awakening. That one shifted from late July to August 11th, so... That's why it's still hanging around. Uh, then on August the 15th, it'll be Favorable Book 4. Also on the 15th of August, it'll be The Last War of Un Unigaya. Uh, and then also on August the 20th, Shaman's Revenge. Uh, that one shifted from the 30th to 20th because uh, the author said that's when it's going to come out. So I'm only going to go by what he says. Uh, also on August the 22nd, it's going to be Shards of Reality, a lit RPG adventure. Enter the Realm Book 1. Uh, and then finally... All the way into the end of September, September 28th, on the last continent, Alter Game Book 2. So, there you go. That's the stuff coming out for uh, the rest of July, all of August, and even a little bit of September. But that's all I have. Okay, on to uh, new releases and reviews.
Okay, first book in new releases and reviews, folks, is going to be The Eternal Transcend uh, Worlds of Gaim, a book three written by uh, Dahaya Anbajagini. I'm probably saying it wrong, but you can see the picture. Okay, uh, this is uh, 250 pages, $3.99 that is available on Kindle Unlimited. The um, I'm just going to read you my description of the summary of the story. Uh, the story starts off two months after the end of the last book. Zorin has unlocked the second spirit lock and has re- resurrected an ancient dragon and made him part of his team. While the investigating an odd spiritual entity, Zorin, uh, Zorin Diablo, and his team find a lady in white and what they think is an eternal. And then suddenly they're all thrown into the past. Uh, not just any past either. It's the time of the great eternal dragon war. Can Zorin find out who pulled them into the past and get back home? So that's my, you know, synopsis of the story. Um, and the answers to that, spoilers, yes and no. So um, if you don't want to know anything about the story, skip ahead about five seconds. But basically, yes, they found out who pulled them in the past, but they spent about 87% of the novel finding him. And they're, and they're basically sent there by a number of people to do it. But no, they don't go home. So uh, the story doesn't have a, a solid conclusion. Um, just letting you know in advance. There you go. Okay. Um, I knew this story. We can have some issues as soon as I learned time travel. I'm like in a time travel story, especially when it's not part of the original core series, um, part of the series storyline. It, it's it's usually a red flag that things might be going wrong in the series or that the author might be trying to change things and shake them up. Um, it, it's very much like jumping the shark on a television series, in my opinion. Um, if it's done right, great. It's amazing. But a lot of times it's really difficult to do. So when I, as soon as I saw time travel in this particular series, I'm like, Oh, okay, let's go with this. Let's see what happens. Um, and generally, um, time travel stories like this fall into two different categories. One, they go back in the past and they change things inadvertently or overtly, and it changes it all the stuff that came before it. Okay. Um, or, they follow the temporal harm reductive from Star Trek and they intentionally try to have as little impact on the past as possible, understanding that it will change the future if they do so. And so it's that second choice is usually the more boring choice. Um, it's also the safer choice because it doesn't ruin the stuff you would written previously. Um, and in this case, this story takes the second choice and that they're not going to interact, at least in this book, a lot with the past. The main character runs into himself, um, which is a more powerful version because remember in this series, um, he's re-resurrected in like book one. He doesn't know who he is, um, but it's later revealed he's this super ultra powerful guy who gradually gains his old powers back by doing these um, spirit unlock things. It's complicated. Uh, but in the past version of this, he's totally overpowered. He's like the most powerful character or, or, or eternal in the entire world. So there. Um, but besides that, they don't really interact too much with other characters in the past and even then they do some some memory wipe stuff so that it's not a, an issue with the with the with the time stream um which to me is a little it's a little boring i get that you don't want to mess with your story earlier but if you're going to do time travel stuff you, um you know there are just so many options and opportunities uh this was very much a safe path which to me made it slightly less entertaining than i think it could have been um there's plenty of action the main characters fight a bunch of high level monsters that are extinct apparently in the regular timeline, the regular time they're from. And most of the story really is geared towards figuring out who pulled them into the past. And again, that happens very late in the story. Um, and even then it's, they're essentially sent there by um, the main character's old self, the old Diablo, um, and by a bunch of other characters, which I won't go into their plot lines. Um, but they're all, they're, they're the main character and his group are literally transported to the foot of the the guy who time traveled them, uh, his, his castle at the very end. It's like, so it, it very much does feel like a lot of magic, uh, magic wand waving and that the main characters don't do much on their own to progress the plot. It's other characters doing it for them. Like, Oh, being big giant red signs or, you know, teleport pads, sending them where they need to go. So I didn't enjoy this particular story as much as I might have some of the others in the series. Like book two in this series was relatively decent one. I, 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 I liked it. There's still some of the issues with a bunch of plot coupons or magic wand waving, but not as much as previous series. And a lot of that is kind of returned um, in this particular story in that the plot is advanced um, by just, by the way, or, you know, just the right character happens to show that to point them in the right direction or were to magically teleport them. And so for me, uh, the story did not um, satisfy as much. So for me, it gets a score of six out of 10.
not bad, but like not good either. So there you go. Okay, on to our next book, Kingdom Level 3. Uh, it is the third book in the Kingdom series. Written by Adam Drake. Okay, it is a 272 pages long, $3.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. I'll read you the author's synopsis. When every citizen in Anika suddenly banishes without a trace, Rob finds himself completely alone in his little kingdom. He must locate his people and quick or risk losing everyone. Armed with only low-level skills and crummy gear, he must travel into the western mountains, where troglodytes skulk in dark tunnels and dragons rule the sky. But there's one vital weapon he needs to help him in his quest, and it will take a tremendous act of courage to acquire magic. So there you go. Okay, um, I wanted to like the story a lot more than I did. Um, like the first eight percent of the story actually is really, really good. And that's mostly because it changes perspective. The first eight percent of the story is told from the perspective of the uh, peck slavers who essentially kidnap everybody in the main character's kingdom. Um, and for those who are not familiar with the story, the main character was a janitor who teleported to this game world and made the king of this like small little tiny you know, um, section of land, um, you know, with a bunch of game walls around it that he had to unlock by becoming more powerful. Uh, and so even though in book two, he expanded the, the, the boundaries, he also uh, allowed other people from other lands uh, to also enter his kingdom. And so in book three, uh, a bunch of peck slavers have come in and kidnapped his citizens to sell them to a slave market. And so they kidnap everybody and the main character um, b- basically realizes it at some point, but the first eight percent of the novel is told from the, those slavers' perspective, and so for me, it was a really nice shift in in getting someone other than the main character's jaded perspective, and seeing an actual citizen of this world and their culture and their background and their different perspective on the trade that they. Because from the slavers' perspective, what they're doing isn't wrong; it's not bad. Um, so it was nice to see a different perspective and a different world view than just the main characters. And I thought, okay, this this the story is finally opening up. It's going to give you some world building. We're going to learn about other lands, other cultures, um, and that doesn't happen, unfortunately. After that eight percent, it's just back to the main character's perspective, Rob, Rob the janitor king, um, and it stays with him the rest of the story. Um, and it becomes more about Rob and his singular journey in tracking down the people of his kingdom, um, but more so in him growing in power and. For a, 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 a series called Kingdom, I'm always hoping for more kingdom building, and it just hasn't happened in this series. Um, and so I'm, I'm a little disappointed in this particular novel, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'll give the novel like another one more book, but I'm like, it's not really fulfilling the expectations that the title kind of progresses, because to me, the story is supposed to be about kingdom building. It's in the title, um, which is what I was, it's kind of teased in the book one a little bit, um, but it's never really fleshed out and fulfilled. In and in this particular story, it's, it's definitely the case in that the main character, Rob, is literally just, he, he abandons the quest. I'm not going to say abandon, but he, he goes on a side quest um, from tracking down the citizens to getting magic and, and to doing other side quest things. And, like, and it, it kind of goes against the, the kind of premise of this particular novel in that he has to hurry up and save his citizens before they're sold into slavery. And yet he takes a bunch of time to go on a bunch of side quests. And eventually they tie up at the end and that those things end up saving everybody um, in a very magic wand kind of way that, that the main character doesn't really do anything himself, which is another problem I have with the story. Um, but for me, I'm like, I'm, 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 I kept hoping to see kingdom building in this series and it's just not happening at this point. And I'm like, okay, this is, I'm like, okay, it's, it's, it's okay. So uh, for me, it just gets another six out of 10. So there you go. Okay, uh, on to our next story, The Long Road to Karn, Realm of Archon, book five, written by G. Akila. Okay, this is uh, 316 pages. It is $5.99. It is not available on Kindle Unlimited. The uh, author's description. When driven by a goal, the impossible oft becomes doable, like slaughtering an entire coven of the twice-cursed gods adepts without mercy, or leading a legion of demons to storm the last bastion of the cursed pr- princedom. But as the impossible hurdles keep coming on, even that drive may not be enough for Crean to escape demon grounds, make it to a higher plane, reunite with his sister and friend, and exact revenge on his mortal enemy. Enemy. Okay. Um, this is the 
fifth book in this series. Book four was a change of perspective. And a lot of the advertising for this one was like, oh, Karin's back. Don't be annoyed. Uh, so it is all from the main character of, of most of the series perspective. Roman, a.k.a. Karn. Okay. Um, it's um, I'm, my real quick review of the story. Remember, it's only been basically a couple months since the main character, Roman, was trapped in the game by his evil boss, dumped into an uh, unreleased high-level demon expansion. And in those few months, um, after dying many, many times in the very first book, he's found a way not only to survive, but also to get him on some really epic quests within the demon lands. He's gone from a nerf noob to a high level zone leader of legions. He literally has legions of soldiers behind him and they're on their way to conquer a castle and gain territory of a massive territory. And that's where the novel starts out at. Um, that's like really the first page. It's like, Oh, we're going to conquer this kingdom. We're, you know, we're finishing off the last of these enemies kind of thing. And then they're going to, to Crydea, um, to, to actually conquer the capital of this little, principality i don't it, a, a prince i think they call it technically i don't know what like the land stratification is or anything um but it's basically it's its own little kingdom basic uh section of land in a larger kingdom uh and so if he can if he can conquer that that castle with his legions then he actually becomes the ruler of that area and so he can do a bunch of town building stuff he can start raising taxes uh, doing skill building a bunch of stuff like that but that's not going to happen in the story because it's more about the conquering at least for the first half of the book now, um, I'm not going to get too spoilery about what happens because um, some of it's really cool. Some of it's also, um, there's a lot of storylines in here that are happening all at once, um, including like a lot of stuff being tied off from like way back in book one. Like there's a lot of storylines that are finally finished off in this novel before, you know, you get to, uh, in, in the next book, hopefully, him shifting planes, potentially. Um uh, so Korean Samozon in this particular novel, uh, also a unique quest though, that takes him to all the high lands, uh, high offices in the demon lands. There's a little bit of um, political intrigue in the story too. So if that's not your thing, it might be a little bit of turnoff, but there's a ton of action, lots of good fighting, lots of good loot getting, um, upgrading skills. I can like a lot of other um, of the novels in this particular series. The levels kind of jump a little bit. Like every single level is noted, but after like a huge battle, the main character can sometimes jump five or six levels. And it's like, okay, just be aware that that happens. Um, uh, and overall, just had a really good time reading the story. Um, I give this novel a score of 7 out of 10. Uh, I really can't say too much about the storyline. So there's basically two main plot lines. One, the Kriyank, uh, the, the Crydia Castle thing. That's about the first half of the novel. Then the rest of it, it is exploring uh, possibilities of a new storyline that the main character picks up that I'm not going to spoil it for you, but it does take the rest of the story. And then towards the end, it's like, oh, clearing off a few other like old storylines so overall really good story had a good time reading it um but a lot of this you're not going to understand if you haven't read like books one through four so there it is what it is um for me score seven ten though there you go okay uh, on to our next story necromancers demons and kings uh world of samar book two written by jared mandani also uh called lit rbg freaks so there you go it is uh, 294 pages, $3.99, and so it is available on Kindle Limited. Uh, I will read you the author's description. Uh, now safe from the grip of Bologna Shark and his old demons, Harrison wishes to move on with his new life. His life would venture inside the world of Samar. As Bishop, the half-breed hunter, together with his guild, he intends on keeping the lead and becoming the first group to defeat Valenistrius, lieutenants, Valen, the evil demon goddess. However, Bishop should have learned that nothing ever goes as planned in Samar. He will meet with this strange cult with immense powers. Bishop will uncover a secret that threatens the entire realm, because if he's now free of danger in the outside world, the challenges in-game are only beginning to arise. Soon, Bishop and his friends will taste defeat for the first time. Lurking in the shadows, Valanestrius will seek to win Bishop to her cause, but when the hunter refused, she will go on to show him that his decision could have devastating consequences and not just in this virtual world. When the game starts to leave marks in real life, where should the line be drawn? With evil creatures in his path threatening to steal away everything he cares about, will Bishop have no other choice but to let his demon half take over? So there you go. That's the author's description. Okay. 
Um, let's see, I think I read that already. Two ninety-four pages, three ninety-nine available in Kindle Unlimited. Just saying, double check. Um, basically, in the first book, Harrison was recruited as a beta tester for one of the most advanced full immersion MMOs ever. He plays a half demon ranger. Um, he's already formed a guild, defeated some demon lords, and now he's doing the same thing in the rest of this novel. That's like, that's the in game story. Um, the big question is. Um, will he fall to the dark side or will he stay? And, you know, there's a bunch of questions like that. Uh, but there's also some really interesting um, artificial intelligence, virtuality questions that, that I thought were kind of cool. Um, there are a couple of plot lines going on in the story at this point. Um, most are very action oriented. There's the in game ongoing quest to defeat the demon lords and prevent the demon queen from taking over the game world. That's like the in game MMO stuff. Um, in the novel, Sorry, in the story, the demon lord must be defeated. Who must be defeated? Like the big boss is a demoness called uh, Valenstrius or Valen. Um, and the mini boss that the main character is trying to defeat in this particular storyline is a demoness uh, who uses succubies and sirens to tempt men to their doom. So um, that's one of the demon lords that must be defeated in this particular section of the story. Um, I think last story it was a couple other demon lords. Um, the secondary plot line um, stems from a quest to clear an undead castle um, and it has some semi-political storylines about the king uh, possibly not being who he says there so a little bit of political intrigue in this one as well um, and but for me that was the second storyline is actually more interesting of them the first one is very much an excuse to kill demons or bad guys or NPCs or player characters and so there's a lot of action oriented stuff there clearing out dungeons going through quest lines just murdering bad things left and right so that's where you get most of your action and the second plot line um, involving the the, the, who actually has the right to rule the kingdom, um, some flashback stuff about what actually happened with the last king. Uh, that to me is a little more interesting because it is not as straightforward. It's not just kill. It's like the main character and his team have to think about how to use this information uh, because in this game world, the things that they do have an effect on, on, on the community. It's not just, it's not all scripted. Uh, and so the main character is actually getting information that he's probably not supposed to get yet, but because of his unique character class or his luck or whatever or the connections he made to other non-player characters he's getting a bunch of information that he can then use to change the storyline within this virtual reality world so i thought that was kind of cool um there are also a lot of other smaller thread storylines in the story including like the main character finally getting some romance which i thought was going to be as well um but uh there are some issues with the story that had uh it in it um the third plot line in the story which is um where I had a lot of issues. Um, the evil AI entity called Valenestrius, who's the demon queen, um, she apparently, for some reason, is able to influence and harm the main character outside the game. Um, this was lightly touched in book one. It is more heavily emphasized in book two in that he's literally getting in the game, the, the character is harming him, like she'll grab his throat um, and try to choke him out or she'll burn him at fire um, in game. And then as he logs out in this... Um, big virtual training facility that the game developers have for everybody, um, he'll show handprints on his throat or he'll actually have a second degree burn on his chest that eventually go away later. And he, in addition, he's having nightmares about this uh, crazy demon lady and whispers in his ear uh, from her outside of the game. And so that is, while it's a very cool idea, for me, the, the logic is not founded in the story yet. Um, there is no talk about um, the artificial intelligence is becoming self-aware or trying to escape the game yet. Um, it's kind of hinted at that it might be the way it's going to go or that it's maybe they tapped into like some alternate universe, but it hasn't actually been stated yet. So for, for, for one, that kind of behavior um, doesn't make sense physically. Like digital incidents becoming physical realities. Um, it's not like, you know, in Sword Online, the characters died in the game and then I roll off because they essentially had a bomb strapped to their head in their virtuality headsets. Um, and so there was a, a correlation between them dying in the game and then triggering a bomb or something or, or whatever it was in this particular world, that sort of connection does not quite exist or is not explained yet. It's sort of explained away as like, Oh, it's your mind creating the physical effects in your body. And like, and that's kind of a, 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 a way that the author uses to potentially explain it away. Um, but it doesn't really make sense to me. So it bothers my, my gamer science brain, I think, a lot. Additionally, um, the fact that the main character, even though he knows he's being harmed by this, by this uh, other AI or, or demon queen, and then he can, continues to play, like the logic behind it also doesn't make sense. He basically says, I'm doing this so that 
the demon queen doesn't target the rest of my group or my guild or my team um even though that hasn't happened yet um and so he says i'm still going to go in so i can be the target and so they're not you know they're not going to be targeted by her um and that seems like that doesn't make sense to me because the game developers know about it and they don't stop the main character and the main character knows that he can actually physically be harmed by this creature and he continues to play um for what benefit because it's not like he wants to make money anymore. Like that was part of the, the, the motivation book one for him playing in the first place was to get back on his feet, uh, make some money from, from playing the beta of the success and also to prove that he's not a loser basically. And he, he did that in book one. And so in book two, he's already made the money so he's not trying to make money anymore. And he, outside of just, I like these people, it doesn't really make sense that he would stay in the game and, and, and suffer physical harm from this AI character. And I'm all rambling a little bit, but it just bugged me and it, and it took a little way from the story from from for me so overall it's a good story it is um there's lots of action um demon and undead slaying um there are some really cool looks into like advanced powers that the characters can have and they're kind of neat um and again the romance thing was kind of a neat little additional thing in the trailer that was kind of cute uh it's just that some of the plots and the story didn't take places that i thought they were gonna do and that's good and mad um but those are the things I talked about kind of took away a little bit, but still I had a really good time. It's just those few things like, uh, but it's still a good story. It gets a score of seven out of 10 for me. So there you go. Okay. On to office wars, uh, episode two, bathroom politics is written by James Patton. Okay. Uh, this one is 135 pages according to Amazon currently. I remember it's in pre-order right now. The author says it should show something in the 200s because it is actually bigger than the first novel. It is 53,000 words though. So that should give you kind of an estimate of how long it's actually going to be. It is uh, $2.99 to purchase. It'll be available on Kindle Limited when it comes out on August the 1st. Um, I will read you, you know, I'm going to do the full disclosure thing first. Um, full disclosure, the author sent me an early review copy. Um, I've already purchased it for a pre-order. Also, um, this review is coming out several days before the novel actually hits Amazon shelves. Uh, the author asked me to do it this way because he wanted to experimentally test what um, getting review out before the novel actually hits would do for sales, basically. So, um, like, he got he got the novel to me in time to do it by my deadline I gave him, so I'll review it. And we'll all kind of see to see how this experiment goes for him, whether because this type of thing I could kind of see going really good or really bad. Like uh, a good review might bump pre-order shells. A really bad review might, you know, knock them down a little bit. And so it's it's a it's definitely a choice from the author. He asked me to do it. I'm like, we'll we'll try the experiment, man. And so that's why this is coming out a little bit early. Okay. Um I will read you the author's description of the story. Um, it is office wars is in full swing and Bran finds his everyday life in disarray. Vicky poses a problem, but he lacks the time and resources to figure out. He can no longer bail on office wars or it could very well mean his freedom. His employer manipulates him to a deal, but Bran cannot be sure what is really at stake. There is even a salary on the line. And if Bran fails to hold up his end of a deal, he'll become a surf for the next five years. And in the middle of everything, he is starting to believe the people on his team are becoming real friends. Oh no. As he gets to know some of them, he realizes Office Wars could change their lives, and his decision in Office Wars were inadvertently putting them all at risk. A tough decision is before him, and he might have the one, the one poker chip that can bind them all. Uh, between his employer's manipulation, Vicky, Office Wars, and the potential permanent loss of his friends that he's finding out that he cannot all be done. He cannot do it all alone, I should say. Can he navigate this challenging world and still hold on to the things he cares most about? Or are all the secrets going to tear his world apart? Bum, bum, bum. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, the first 6% of the story you should be aware almost feels like a different story. It's a prologue about an AI named Vonix that creates a bunch of metal zombies um, from living humans after it ceases to control of them in a bid for freedom for the real world. Um, it, it, it's a good, it's a nice little story um, that the author, I talked to the author by, by like basic messenger a few times. Um, he kind of explained it to me this way. He, he intends for like these little prologues or interludes in the story uh, to almost be little short stories that will connect to a larger plot line later on in the series. So he's, he's definitely planning ahead with all this stuff. So even if you read it um, and you don't see how it directly connects yet, he, the author plans to connect it all later. Um, 
So don't be thrown off that, that it that it reads like your first section reads like a different novel. It's connected to this world. Uh, but by seven percent of the novel, you're right back in the main storyline with the brand who's doing the office war thing, which is kind of the core of what I loved about the story. Like I'm okay with the extra stuff if it makes sense eventually. Um, but the thing I c- come to read for the story is is the office war stuff, the actual office war thing. But so the offer get, gets you there by seven percent of the novel. Um, the you know uh, main character gets a couple of new powers, which are kind of cool. Um, you reconnect with Finn and a couple of his um, artifact, artificial intelligence inses. Um, so it's it's a nice catch up with them as well. Um, there is kind of a brief scene I should probably warn you about, um, in that it is a little sexual. It's also a little rapey, um, and it's of the main character. Like um, within the first beginning part of the Office War section of the story, seven percent. He talks to his heir for a little bit, gets a new power, and then he jumps into the game and he immediately has to go talk to his um, actual in-game bosses, the ones that forced him into the office war game. Um, and he makes a deal with them in that if he gets to the halfway point, um, if, he, if he rather if he can't get to the halfway point of office wars, he has to become a serf for five years, which is what's inferred in the in the author description. So it's not spoilery. But if he gets to the twenty five percent mark of office wars, which is super challenging. He'll actually get a lifelong salary, and in a world where, you know, it's it's um, everybody's essentially immortal as long as they stay in their game capsule. That's a very big thing, um, and so those are the stakes that the main character is playing for now. Now, after that, um, one of his bosses, a female, um, actually binds him against his will. She uses some word game power and proceeds to physically assault him in a semi-sexual way. Now, this could go as, depending on how you view it, it could be viewed as bondage or kind of rapey because the main character doesn't consent to being bound. He certainly didn't tend to being uh, physically hurt. Um, even if it is a sexual arousal format. Uh, and the only reason he consents to actually have sex with her is because he wants the pain to stop. Uh, and so it's kind of rapey to me and I'm like, okay, that's, that's kind of a weird insertion, but it could be something along with, like the authors commenting on um, the weird way societies view male rape in a lot of cases. Um, it could also be that the author is really trying to emphasize exactly how evil his corporate bosses are, um, which may be the big thing. But for me, it was kind of weird to be in there. And then later on, like in the next scene, the main character's AI is like, oh, well, I kind of did you a favor. I got slayed, um, even if it wasn't in a way that he, the main character actually wanted. So I'm like, maybe that's, may, there may be some subtext there that I'm just not quite getting, or maybe I'm getting them out. I know it's connecting to like the larger storyline yet, but just so you're aware that that is there. It's a very small part of the story though. Okay. Um, there's a lot of really cool things in the story after that though. Once the main character meets back up with his team, he chooses a new specialization and they're off to clear the levels of the game. And there's a lot of cool stuff there. Um, lots of office space jokes. Um, the group becomes more cohesive unit as he gets to know them and see their, their backstories and why they're playing the office wars. Some of them want to be free of their serfdom. Some of them just want to advance, but for each one of them, like the synopsis says, it means a life altering potentiality for it for them. So there you go. There's a bunch of um, fights, mazes, puzzles that they solve. So um, very much what happened in book one expanded. So great stuff there. Um, there's also, of course, a lot of hilarious situational humor. Again, a ton of office space jokes. If you've seen that movie and you enjoy it, you're going to get a lot of them and you're going to get like an extra layer of hilarity in this particular novel. So there you go. Overall, um, really good story. Um, if there are a few IRL um, in real life threats to the main character that also be threaded into the story. Which I thought was kind of a neat turn. Um, it hits all the right funny bones for me. It mixes action and tension with the virtual reality death game. Um, and the speculative con- conversations about virtual reality and artificial intelligence are really nice um, little cherries on top that I thought were kind of cool. Uh, so there you go. Um, also, don't forget the book one is going to be free from July 28th to August the 1st. So you can pick that up if before this one comes out to catch up for free. So you can't go wrong with that. Uh, the score of the novel gets for me a score of seven out of 10. So there you go, I enjoyed it. Okay, on to Tossing the Salad, Cavern the Creature short story from Robert Bevan. Uh, it is 99 cents, it is 30 pages. It is not available on Kindle Limited, um, but for th- 99 cents, um, you know, it's pretty reasonable. I think it's the lowest price you can go for an Amazon Kindle book. So there you go. 
um, I will read you my description of the story. <laughs> it's it's not going to get too spoiler, I hope. Um, our favorite team is trapped in a tabletop game, um, They and they plan to steal some herbs from a healer that is growing them and resell them for a profit. Cooper, of course, eats some, even though he's already been told that they're at the raw, that they're very toxic. And so there's some explosive back-end results. Uh, trying to get Cooper to a cleric, Julian summons a horse that causes the ground beneath them to collapse into a cave, taking Cooper and the whole team with them. And it turns out it's at the home of a giant frog creature, and he's not taking visitors. So there you go. Um, and of course, hilarity, action. Um, some really interesting butt stuff happens. I'm not going to spoil it, but um, it's it's funny. And if you're familiar with the Cavern the Creature series, uh, then you'll ex- there's a certain level of poop humor that you're going to expect in the series in this particular novel, and it it absolutely delivers it's a short story though 30 pages so um just be aware i enjoyed it seven out of ten okay last but not least um the builder sword the legendary builder book one written by j.a cipriano who's a prolific uh he writes a lot of stuff i mean looking at his catalog i'm like there's almost a couple dozen books so um i gotta admire his writing speed if nothing else um it is 338 pages it is four dollars 99 cents it is available on kindle unlimited I will read you the author's description. Uh, off Arthur never expected to wind up in hell, at least not because he was he found an ancient sword in a pawn shop. To make matters worse, hell isn't as he thought. It's a desolate, excuse me, wasteland under siege by an all-consuming void known as the darkness. Now he's trapped with no way home, a ragtag army of women, and a sword whose only power is to modify the abilities of those around him not exactly winning odds worse if the darkness isn't stopped not only will it devour hell but earth will be next on the menu okay um from the description on amazon i really didn't think this was going to be a little bitty story but it absolutely is so uh, i'm glad that i looked at oh, that that somebody suggested that i go back and look at it because it is litter pg and i would have felt bad missing it and not reading it all um the hook in this story is really nice. Like the first um, ten percent of the novel is is quite interesting, and it makes it makes you want to read more. So the author does a really good job of getting you interested in the main character and the storyline very quickly. Um, after the main character Arthur Curry spends his life savings on a beatable sword, he has the power to see people's character sheets, um, whether it's his or all the stuff that he owns in his house, um, and he accidentally summons a succubus, which doesn't quite make sense with the sword thing, but. It is what it is. And so he summons the succubus and he sees, uh, because he's summoned her, I guess the sword thinks it's his property um, because he can only see the stats and characters of things that he owns, his property. And so because he summoned her, apparently she's his property. Um, we'll talk about that that thing later. But she tells him that, oh, you must be the legendary builder and you, your destiny is to save all the women of hell using your new powers. And she kidnaps him to hell and so that's the story gets very quickly but um like i said the hook of the story is really well done like you feel for the character very quickly you feel a desire for the sword and, and his place in the world how he doesn't feel important and so for getting a magic power like this seems kind of cool and it makes you interested and engage in the story so good job there uh for the author in, in making me interested in the story um my interest kind of petered off a little bit from that point but you know that's that's a separate issue so a good hook um, a lot of the early part of the story kind of seems to exist solely to explain or show off the main character's part, like literally the first half of the story. Um, there's a, uh, in, in hell, apparently all the men were killed off. Um, and so that's all women because the darkness ha- knows about a prophecy about the builder coming and him being male. And so all the men in hell were killed off again kind of an inconsistent plot hole, but I'm like, okay, we'll, we'll skip that for now. Um, and so the main character comes in this town led by this succubus named Gwen. And, you know, he's told that he has to help them and he sees all their ability scores and their character sheets. And he starts like adding things up and, and kind of messing with their, um, their class skills and giving them new powers and, and expanding the experience points that they have there. Um, and it, it, in some ways it makes sense in that it's the main character has to be important. And so I get that part of the story. Like yeah, that, that's his power. That's something he can do. So he's going to use it to save everybody. But from a different perspective, he's coming to essentially a, a, a town he doesn't know and talking to and, and talking to a bunch of very capable, potentially powerful women who 
aren't really filling their potential until he upgrades them and makes them better um, and helps. And, and until he does that, that, apparently they're not able to defend against uh, the darkness very well. And so from that perspective, it seems a little weird. Um, but if you can ignore that, that little bit, um, then you really might enjoy the story. Um, there are some other issues I had with the story from the cover and some of the early scenes in the story, um, there's kind of a promise of a harem aspect to the novel. And it's not really fulfilled in the last 20% of the story, but when it does, it's very funny. Uh, there's no like graphic sex or anything. But um, from the cover, you can see, okay, this is this is kind of implied, and it's not fulfilled until the very end. Um, it's not graphic sex, a lot of faded box stuff. But again, it's, it's how it's fulfilled is kind of funny, and I like that about it. Um, so, But it's just late in the game to kind of fulfill on that promise. So there you go. Um, another thing I, issue I had with the story was kind of the lack of world building. Like at the beginning, of that hook very well done. I, I I felt for the character, empathized with them. But after that point, after that percent point, um, a lot of that fades away in favor of explaining the game mechanics and in favor of seeing the main character um, look at all the skill sheets, character sheets, and and a bunch of game stuff. The author either didn't have time or room, whatever, but there wasn't a lot of like world being. I don't know much about hell. Like, for, well, I'll tell you it this way. Um, at the end of the novel, I know more about the villain of the story than I do about the main character. And I know about more about her motivations and I, I empathize more with her than I do with the main character and most of the main cast. Um, and that feels a little skewed to me. I mean, it's always good to um, empathize and understand the main character or the, the villain's motivations, but I should probably understand at least as much about the main character and and understand where he's coming from, what his background is, and what the background of the main uh, the other characters are as well. Um, so, for me, I'm like that, that lack of world building kind of took away from the story a little bit. Not a lot, but but it was enough. Um, the bigger thing for me were like the huge plot holes in the story and some of the inconsistencies within the game rules or the the characters themselves. Um, this is going to get a tiny bit spoiler. So you want to skip ahead a couple minutes if you don't want to hear this, you know, some of the plot holes I saw. Um, but for, for me, it just has a few examples. Um, very later in um, midpoint from the story on, one of the main characters, the main, uh, one of the, uh, the, the demons that the main character knows and cares for is kidnapped by the bad guy. Bad lady, I should say. Um, but for some reason, it never occurs to him to try to summon her to him using his magic sword, which would have seemed like a really easy solution and kind of negating the entire reason for the second half of the story. I mean, big plot for maybe, maybe I missed something that prevented him from doing the story. But for me, that was like, why doesn't he just use his magic sword summoning power to summon that demon he owns uh, from the evil people? Cause he, he summoned him for from hell to earth, which seems very, you know, a, a larger distance, but whatever. Um, I can kind of overlook some of these things. Uh, in addition, thing, some characters within this world and hell seem to know about the experience points, the levels, the skill tree kind of thing, but others don't. And there's no real explanation why there's a difference. Additionally, um, the very overpowered villainess, um, who doesn't show up to like halfway in the story, you don't see her until then. Um, she literally has the main character in her hands many times. And every single time he escapes by some magic wand effect, like, you know, some magical event happens that just happens to save him uh, and push her away for some other fight later in the day, later in the story. And so that happens a lot in the story. And so for me, just all these combinations and things kind of took away from the story for me. But if you can ignore those things, you're probably really going to like it. Like there are, in the Amazon reviews for the story, there are essentially two groups. One, people who can't ignore those puddles um, and those inconsistencies. And so they give them less than stellar reviews. And then there's everyone else, those other people, the other half is like, they just, they can ignore it and they're like, this is good. The action's good. The crafting is good. And both narratives are true. Like if you can ignore these plot holes um, and inconsistencies, great. You're going to like this story probably more than I do because there are things in the story that are really good and they're really nice. For example, the action stuff. Action is well written. There are gradually increasingly difficult combat scenes. Um, the monsters have a great variety of, of, of types and different ways that the characters have to figure out how to beat them. Um, crafting is really important in the story in that that's essentially how these problems are solved. Sometimes a little disconveniently, but crafting is important in the story, which I liked. There's also a, a very good explanation of the skill trees that these various classes and, and, and crafting um, classes have or their combat or crafting. There's a nice descriptive section. So I understand all the different possible choices and the main character chooses whatever it is for 
whatever reasons. But the the explanation of the game mechanics is there and i like that about the story um because again for me the more i understand about the world the english game kind of wise the better i like it um and again the like i said the the, the hook in the beginning is really nice um but overall like i said not a bad story this this really does ex- remind me of an expanded version of the town but the invite scene from one of the author's other um little beauty series kind of combined with the unique skill of upgrading his property from super cells and superheroes. It's like those two ideas were meshed together, combined, and this is what came out. Um, however, um, even though I do like the crafting, I like the, the combat in, in the story, um, the lack of world building, some really big plot holes, inconsistencies, and the magic, I, I think people call them, some people call them um, plot coupons or magic wand waving to f- figure out problems, kind of started from being as enjoyable for me. Um, again, some other people might really like it, despite those things. That's cool. Um, for me, it gets a score of 6 out of 10. So there you go. That is it. Seven stories all wrapped up for you folks and reviewed. Um, remember, you can follow the, the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Patreon. Um, plenty of places to c- come and support. So remember, this show does not exist without you folks and your support. Um, like I said, this show is me giving reviews, but it's more about me connecting with you in the audience about this thing that I love, LittleRPG. So thank you very much. And if you want to support the podcast in any way, shape, or form, you can find all the ways you do so at littlerpgpodcast.com forward slash support. But again, thanks for hanging out with me. Uh, had a good time talking to you and goofing off and, and gushing about LittleRPG and the things that I really love. Um, and remember, until I see you again, oh, before I forget, uh, next week and for the next couple weeks after that, I'm actually going to be on the road. Um, it's going to be a vacation for me but i'll still be doing podcasts and reading a bunch of little bit books um you're probably going to see a more casual ramon because i'm not going to be at home i'm going to be traveling um all the way up to oregon um for you know and so i'll be it, it's going to be interesting to see how i'm going to do the podcast on the road so you you're, you're probably not going to get as good lighting um you're still going to get a mic so because i record this on my phone so not an issue there um but it is going to be fun interesting and if anybody happens to be on the road along the way more than happy to go hang out with you guys. We can do a little RPG, an impromptu little RPG meetup or something. Um, shoot me the details of where you're all along the way. We'll see if I can fit you in for like a beer. Maybe we can have lunch together, whatever. Um, you can always shoot, shoot me email at uh, feedback at geekbuyspodcast.com. Um, but there you go. That's the news about next week and the week after that. Um, so there you go. Um, thanks again for hanging out with me. Until we can hang out again, remember folks to go read some little RPG. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.